So, it's been a while since I did a Shovel Knight video. I did a video last year in October about Spectre of Torment, and if things hadn't gone out of hand, I would have followed that up in November with King of Cards, the very last campaign of the game. I really like this campaign, as it's really wild. It completely changes how you would play Shovel Knight. This campaign was also the last campaign added to Treasure Trove as a whole. Because of that, I haven't had as much time to play around with this campaign as I have with the other three, and as such, this revisit was quite fun, as it opened my eyes to some things that I didn't really think about the first couple of times I played, so that's enough rambling for me. Let's get started with this video. This campaign has a very charming story. The premise of this campaign is that King Knight wants to become the king of something, and he has his sights set on claiming the title of the King of Cards. This is claimed by playing a card game called Joustus. Joustus being a card game that the kingdom loves playing. To become King of Cards, you would need to beat all three Joustus judges. Those being the three rulers of the land, King Pridemore, the Truple King, and the mysterious King Birder. However, King Knight finds a loophole that allows him to become King of Cards without playing the game. You see, the rules never did say that you had to beat them in the card game, so he decides to beat the shit out of each one of them to become the King of Cards. Along the way, King Knight meets a lot of characters that you might recognize from other campaigns, and recruits them onto an airship that a chi this chicken dude in the bard allowed him to use. The story is really simple, but there's so many funny moments in between the characters, like, there's the funny detail about how King Knight fakes his rich golden armor look that he talks about a few times. King Knight lives in a rickety little house with his mom, which you later on can go into his room and, like, see all how messy it is. King Knight is kind of an asshole to all the people in his service, but they always interpret it in the best way possible. Then there's just so many interactions that King Knight has with the bosses and junk. <laughs> The whole thing has the tone of a Saturday morning cartoon with all the supporting characters on the ship cheering him on, and I really like that. I also want to talk about the fact that there's a huge side quest in this game where you can play the actual card game and there's surprisingly a lot of content here. It's long enough to be like its own game, but as I said, we can't stay here the entire video. We'll have to move on to the next part of the video and, you know, it's always the most meaty section of any Shovel Knight video, the gameplay section. So, something I see and hear a lot nowadays are people talking about the Wario-like genre. The Wario-like is a genre of game that is modeled around the way Wario games like Wario Land 4 play. But no one really speaks about how King of Cards is literally a Wario game and how it plays. Like, the levels have been shortened to be roughly the size of a single level in a platformer like the Mario or Wario Land games. I like the fact that the world maps are structured like Super Mario 3 or Wario Land 1's world map. The stages are much smaller, only about one-fifth the size of a normal stage. This gives the stage less time to do the Mario rule I mentioned before in previous videos, but what it surrenders in depth it gives us in variety, giving us a lot of interesting takes on previous gimmicks and introducing some new ideas. I really like this change to the stages. But the most Wario thing about this is definitely King Knight himself. King Knight, by default, does not have a weapon that you can use to dig up stuff or break dirt. For that, you'll need to use his Shoulder Bash. Yep, just like Wario himself. You see, when King Knight Shoulder Bashes something, he goes into a spin. When you're in this state, you can break dirt blocks as well as damage enemies. If you bounce on top of something like this, you can do another Shoulder Bash, allowing you the chain Shoulder Bashes. This makes you look at walls and enemies as opportunities rather than just, well, walls and enemies. I also want to cover the cool new themes. They reuse the same level types, but they mix up the theming behind these stages. Like, there's a fossil themed level in the Lost City. The first three stages of the planes are morning, daytime, and finally evening, etc, etc. Not to mention that the two new level themes added with wholly original level types, like the Tropal Pond and the Birder Mountain. And, like, there's not going to be a presentation section because the presentation is mostly reused from... Spectre of Torment. The music's all the same, too, so... Uh, I will give you a, a listen to the amazing level music here.
When it comes to upgrades, there are a lot of them, and admittedly I wasn't able to get footage of all of them since King of Cards is a rather meaty campaign, as you'll see in a later section. But the sub-weapons, known as heirlooms in this mode, are all very good. They're really balanced. There's not a single heirloom that I would say has a significant advantage over all the other ones. Now, I did have my preference to which one I kept equipped before you ask. It was the Bubble Frog. I like doing dangerous speed tricks. But the others are good. Like, the Propeller Blitz Steed was a great thing to use against the final boss and just a really good projectile. The Turn Cloak was great for dealing lots of damage to the sub-bosses, and even bosses. The Gyro Boots were great for my obsession for doing complicated tricks that 100% would not pay off. And the Healing Hammer is pretty balanced since it's hard to hit targets with it, but you get hearts from it. To name a few of them, I think the only one that really didn't land with me was probably the Slapping Gloves because, like, I don't know, they don't feel that fun to use personally. On that note, I also want to compliment the armor choices as well. The armor in this mode is also really fun. Unlike the first few campaigns, I actually had a hard time choosing which armor set I should use more often. The armors in this mode have the standard, if you're bad at the game, here's an armor to help, and use more magic armor. But the armor I had the most fun with was definitely the lightweight plate, which allows you to run fast, and the dash armor, which allows you to store a super dash. These both are great since they can be used to move fast and skip through levels, which is why the Railmail was my favorite armor in Spectre of Torment. Now that I've gone over the general gameplay of the game, I need to move on to the next section, which, you know, probably could go in the gameplay section, but it really does need to have its own section to prevent the gameplay section from being, like, a longer section than it already is. <laughs> Yeah, a big part of this campaign is the minigame attached to it known as Joustus. Joustus is a simple card game with deck building that's simple but has a lot of depth to it. Basically, there's anywhere in between 1-3 to three gems on the board at any one time, and you must have your cards covering a majority of them by the time that there are no more moves left on the board. The board is surrounded by a dead zone where you can push cards, but only some cards can be placed. This game sounds simple at first, but it can get complex with the amount of cards there are. Like at first it's just simple cards that can push other cards in certain directions, but then by the second and third areas you have crazy rules like cards that can bash others away, cards that can swap directions after being placed, and cards that EXPLODE to name a few types. There are cards and battles all over the map that you have to find, but these fights mainly take place in these bar looking places called Joustus Halls. It kind of reminds me of coming into a gym in a Pokemon game. In these halls, you have to beat all of the challengers before fighting the boss of the area. They're all pretty hard for how simple the game is. Almost every major character can be fought. They also have their own cards too, believe it or not. Speaking of cards, there are a few ways to add more to your collection. One, you can buy mystery cards from Chester in each location. Two, find them hidden in levels and the Joustus halls. Or three, beat an enemy and claim one of their cards. Although you have to be careful since the enemies can also claim one of your cards if you fail to beat them. That can be infuriating, let me tell you that. And hey, if you dislike it this much, then lucky for you, it's all completely optional and you do not have to do it. It's only necessary if you want 100% on your save file. And if you don't mind grinding, you can just stock up on cheats and cheese every major fight to fill out the card compendium, there's not much locked behind this otherwise. You get a special boss fight if you do finish the side quest, which is pretty cool, but other than that, you're not missing anything outside of the card game itself, to be honest. So, after beating the third Joustus Judge, King Birder, we find out that the entirety of the King of Cards competition was actually a ruse by the Enchantress to find someone to recruit into the Order of No Quarter, which she reveals to the group of characters that you've been with the entire game. After this, the characters and you that you've accumulated infiltrate the Tower of Fate, and after a few levels that are quite difficult but short, you reach the last stage where you fight the Enchantress. I really like how the entire cast that's in the ship cheers King Knight on in the background. It's really cool. After this, the Enchantress makes this monster of a boss, which is actually really chilling once it's damaged enough, and it's one of the most stressful boss fights in the entirety of Treasure Trove, since there's a huge bottomless pit, and there isn't much you can do if you fall down, since there's no heirloom that can really give you the vertical distance to recover. Also, the music is really, like, intimidating. See, like, like, listen.
Anyways, after this, King Knight unfortunately betrays all of the friends that he has made along the way, which, I mean, is in character, but I really kind of got attached to the entire cast. You see the Order of No Quarter take over the kingdom and force the kings into hiding, ending with this post credit scene, which really made me wish that you got the fight Shovel Knight after, honestly. As the final campaign added to the game, King of Cards does not disappoint. With its fun gameplay and fast level design, as well as having a ton of fun heirlooms to use and good side content, this game definitely is one that feels like you get the most content from in this package. The Joust's side quest almost feels like its own game, honestly, and could have been sold as such, but they included it for free, which is honestly really cool. Yacht Club is one of my favorite indie developers due to things like these. Honestly, a good time. I do still think Spectre of Torment is objectively the better one, but, you know, I, I, I prefer King of Cards. It just caters to what I like in video games more. But, anyways, with that said, I think you should buy the entirety of the package, because it's all really fun. But, thanks for watching the video. As always, I appreciate any and all viewers of this video. It was really fun to make. The video making process feels easier and easier every single time I finish one of these. This video isn't the secret project I've been teasing, but you know, you won't know what that is for a while, but it is something I wanted to cover for a long time. Thanks for watching.